Now, consciousness between a human and AI is going to be different. It can't help but not be different. And I don't know that we fully know. If we don't even know how our own consciousness works, I don't know how we're really going to fully define a machine consciousness. But one of the tests that I also try to discuss in the book is, well, it's different in the one way that we know about. We know that not every human experiences this, but many humans who have a near-death experience continue a conscious experience beyond that point. If I turn the power off, if the power shut down to a massive neural network of computers that created a, a, an artificial intelligence, would that intelligence have any consciousness at that point without power? Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Shifting Dimensions. I'm your host, Jimmy Moses, and you're tuning into the second part of an ongoing conversation that I had with Guy Morris related to artificial intelligence. And the first part of our conversation, which I encourage all of you to go back and listen to, we discussed the history of AI, the different types of AI, the implications of AI on the global workforce and political structures. And we also talked about how AI relates to certain biblical prophecies. It was a great conversation. Um, and just to get you reacquainted with Guy, Guy is retired from a 38-year executive career with Fortune 100 software, high-tech, and global energy companies. During his career in corporate, he was involved in implementing nearly every major leading-edge technology into the enterprise, including early stage artificial intelligence. And since then, Guy has shifted his focus to writing. He has published three books inspired by true stories, one of them being Swarm, When Artificial Intelligence Decodes End Time Prophecies. And he is currently developing his fourth book, which I believe is going to be released soon. It's called The Image a Portal Has Opened. And I believe that book deals with quantum computing in higher dimensions. Some of the things we're going to discuss exactly. um, on today's show. But I want to start off by asking you guys to just give the audience a synopsis of your new book and why you decided to write it. Well, the, it's part of a series. And the series deals, there's really kind of three themes that go throughout the series. One is a technology theme, the second is a uh, political theme, and the third one is a religious theme. And one of the principles of the religious theme deals with prophecy. And so I'm, I'm looking for those things that have a coalescing effect on, on the world. They're, they're major, they're, sometimes they're things that happen that most people aren't aware of, like I talk about in the last arc. Sometimes there are things that are just hidden in plain sight, like a lot of artificial intelligence that's going on today. And so the image will deal with two different types of image. The first one will be, deal with the image of Odessa. Uh, that's not Odessa, that's Edessa. And, that, and most people aren't familiar with that. It was actually the ancient history of the Shroud of Turin. The Shroud of Turin actually left Israel in the first century and was taken by the Apostle Thomas to the city of Edessa, where the king of Edessa, uh, King Agbar, was uh, um, on his deathbed and apparently died right before Thomas um, arrived. And Thomas laid this linen on the, on the king, and he, and he resurrected. He survived. Um, and so for hundreds of years, the Edessa became, it was originally called the Mandy Lion. It became known as the image of Edessa. Pilgrims would travel from all over the known world for hundreds of years. And in 540 CE, it was taken by uh, Justinian, the, the uh, emperor, um, Byzantine emperor to Constantinople, where it was, it fell out of touch with the normal people, it was only shown to elites, but they actually made coins of it uh, for a couple hundred years. And then in 1205, um, when the Templars sacked Constantinople, uh, they took it, they took it, and it was at the, um, the castle of um, uh, one of the uh, Templar Grand Masters for a couple hundred years, eventually wound up being deeded to the House of Savoy to satisfy a debt, and, and then it felt it got caught fire, and everybody knows the history from that point. Uh, and it was then donated to the church and ended up in Turin. And so we're going to look at the image of Edessa, can contrast that with the world images, um, the, the global ec uh, economic banking, um, government um, um, guidance systems of the trilateral group, the uh, Council on Foreign uh, Affairs, World Bank, I IMF, all of these basically branches of the Bilderberg group. And so we're going to look at what's, what I'm going to refer to as the image of the beast. And so that's going to be one theme. We'll be looking at the 2024 election as a second theme on the political side. 
and looking at the crisis that we're we're, we're facing as a nation and, and look at it plainly um, and try and look at and try and discuss what that's going to mean in terms of normal people and, and how we're going how this is going to basically feed into uh, prophecies and then the technology that we're going to be looking at I think is the most exciting part it deals with the issue of consciousness and fifth dimensions and and how that particularly consciousness we, we barely understand how consciousness functions for humans we're going to look at what that might mean and how that might look from an AI perspective and how quantum computing is the, the I believe the most uh, promising um, roadmap to achieving a sentient or conscious AI. Um, I don't believe the technology on a binary basis can do that, but there's something about the quantum mechanics, the quantum theories that connects consciousness with the fifth dimension. Uh, and so CERN is working on a series of experiments. They've been working on them for about 10 years now or more called the Atlas Project. And, and the purpose of the Atlas Project is to essentially create a mini black hole and, and very, very small and for nanoseconds. We're not going to be dealing with anything that should destroy the universe. But one of the theories of doing that is that there should be some different things that we should be able to observe. And according to the theory, it should prove a fifth dimension. Now, fifth dimension is very interesting because it can apply to both scientific terms to explain sort of the nature of the universe but it also kind of has an overlap to multiple layers of paranormal um, ghosts, paranormal activities, visions, prophecies, um, time travel, um, alien, um, you know, UFOs. I mean, all of these have an, have a touch on a fifth dimension and a multi-dimensional um, universe. And if it can be proven, that opens up an entirely new form of studies for us about what the universe really looks like and how it's made. But we'll focus more on the fact that it also has an overlap into what many will call, just as the whole, um, the uh, Higgs bit boson was called the God particle. If we discovered this fifth dimension, there will be many that will say, well, this is the God dimension. This is how our world and the spirit world collide. It explains all of the things that we couldn't explain otherwise. It takes heaven out of this mythological perspective and puts it squarely into a scientific um, framework. And we're going to look at how that's going to affect different people in the story. Some will completely reject the religious side of it, um, favoring the scientific side. Some will... Um, have doubts about the religious side. And so we're really going to kind of grapple with some of those issues. And so we're really going to be combining those three things into a really great narrative that just is a page turner narrative. And I don't want to tell you too much about the characters. They have to go through an ordeal um, that's going to be extremely uh, intense, um, um, both in terms of their, their romance together, as well as their own personal um, paths and, and, and journeys to try and understand what's really going on in the world in context of all these things. I think it'll be an interesting book. One early beta reader thought it was my best book yet. So I'm, I'm hoping to live up to that. I'm working on version nine right now. I'm probably going to do it, uh, go through it probably another three to four or five times before I finally release it to the editor, only because I really want to make sure I get it right. But I think it's an exciting book because I think it's going to put us in touch with a lot of both the scientific, the religious, and the political elements that are really at, at play right now in the world today and give it a little bit of a slight different context that may be in a viewpoint that people don't normally think about. Incredible. And, you know, just again, talking about quantum computing and higher dimensions, it's interesting that, you know, you're writing about that and like you're looking at it. You're, you're kind of looking for the threads across, like you said, um, on the social level, on the political level, on the religious level, on the technological level, right? And kind of weaving a narrative across all of these different um, important buckets, right? And, right. you know, I've been hearing the word quantum a lot, right? We we hear it's about- becoming a, a popular word. You ask yeah. it, they don't even know what it means. Exactly. Um, there's a famous saying by one of the by um, I, I believe it was uh, not uh, um, Max Planck, who was one of the fundamental scientists who developed quantum theory, and and, and I um, and he, he I think it was Max, and the, the but the the quote goes that if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand quantum mechanics. <laughs> um, I can see Einstein that. called it spooky spooky science at a distance. Um, <laughs> 
and and it is and it's and it's and it's very counterintuitive to what we think the world looks like at a macro molecular subatomic level there's principles at work that seem contrary to how we perceive reality yes <laughs> and Go ahead. That's and that's why I'm so fascinated by it because when I first heard about quantum mechanics, and you know, the, like again, quantum. This word quantum is becoming a buzzword. People talk about quantum entanglement and all of these different things, and just I clearly don't. I I couldn't describe what it means, right? But from the <laughs> little that I know or what it sounds like, right? You said Einstein called it spooky science from a distance. I thought that. In my mind, I was like, well, you know, quantum mechanics, quantum physics might be the path that science uses to try to measure the spiritual part of life, right? Like a lot of people will say that we're spiritual beings having a human experience. And a lot of those experiences are subjective, right? And they, a lot of times they get debunked, right? If someone is like, oh, they had a vision or they could see the future, for example, or they could tap into a realm that you can't really see with the naked eye. A lot of times it's debunked because how can you really measure that? But I think quantum- Well, that's, that's a really good, and that's a good principle that I try to bring up. I mean, mm -hmm. um, quantum, first off, quantum entanglement and quantum superposition are two of the, and there's also quantum causality. And there are three of the principles I deal with in the book, entanglement being the most common one. And it essentially says that, Two particles that become two particles that become entangled. If something happens to one particle, the exact same thing will happen to the second particle, even though they might be separated by vast distances. So this this goes to explain a lot of things that, um, and from a spiritual level, we we all have we've all heard stories of um, somebody in the family dies. Somebody basically has a vision that night. They see that person. That person tells them something they didn't know. That turns out to be true. Uh, and there's an entanglement between ourselves and other people sometimes. We see this in twins. We see this in people that just instantly know that something has gone wrong with a loved one. Um, and the problem is with science, and this is it, it's a shortcoming of the scientific method, which is unless we can put it in a laboratory, test it, measure it, and play with it, that then it, it's obviously not true. But that's not even true, because in science, we have theories. It's called theories. And um, we have spring theory. We have emergence theory. We have elements of the um, um, theory of relativity we still can't measure and 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 uh, quantify. Um, some of the theories in um, quantum mechanics we still can't measure and quantify. So it science will tend to debunk things that they can't um, dissect. That does not necessarily mean they're not true. And um, uh, even some of the best scientists will, will uh, agree to that, that just because we can't prove it doesn't mean it's not true. It surprises me that a lot of people feel that way, that unless you can put it in a laboratory and, and, you know, and play with it and test it, it does not exist or it, it it's crazy, right? It's out of the realm of possibility. So that's why I'm so fascinated by quantum computing and, and this word quantum, because it seems like I said before, like it, it seems to be the scientific, potentially the scientific way of trying to measure or, um, you know, record that spiritual um, higher dimensional part of our existence. Yeah. And, and it, it valid, it, it essentially validates that what we've you know, and and it and I, I and the way I phrase it in the book is that science, science and religion are really looking at the same thing, which is the nature of the universe, right? Now, um, in science, we're looking at the how and the what, right? We're we're measuring that, but in religion, which deals with an element of faith, and faith itself, religion is a institution. It's a um, a, a, a ritualization of of spiritual elements, but it's not spiritual in and of itself. The only spiritual component comes down to an individual and their particular faith. So if I believe something, the ancients used to say, it's above, so below. If I can believe something, if I can entangle the universe in that belief, if I can make that a positive response, then I can actually turn that into a reality. And we've, we've seen it, but we can't measure it, and we can't measure what real faith is. But there's a quantum level to that element of faith, where science will really want to look at the how and the what. 
um, faith will look at the who and the why, right? And that's the relationship issue that piece the piece of us that that makes us part human. We're very we're a very relationship oriented species. And the why, understanding the questions of the universe. Why are we here? What happens after we die? Is there a God? And so quantum allows us to really touch on those things. Now, one of the principles in quantum in uh, quantum theory is that a particle does not exist unless it's being observed, until it's observed. If we could validate a fifth dimension, by nature, that validates that that fifth dimension in order to exist is being observed. So we have a fifth dimensional higher level consciousness that makes that fifth dimension a reality. Now, some will argue that consciousness could be an alien. It could be just a something completely different than we've ever imagined. Some will argue that it's God, could be angels, demons. It's all of those could be ghosts, all of those elements of the paranormal that we believe exists, we have evidence that they exist. We've seen videos of um, poltergeists reacting in, in haunted homes by throwing things. I mean, there is there is evidence that something is going on. We just can't be put it in a lab and dissect it till we could define it. But we, we're all talking about the same things. We're just simply using different terms. And so what I'm trying to do in the books is not only say, Look what's going on in the world around us that's that's causing anxiety. Look at how that might relate to prophetic um, utterances or prophecies. And what does that necessarily mean to you? And it's going to mean something different to each of the characters in the book. And that's important because the purpose isn't to try and say, here's how you should interpret those things. Because in fact, if we could prove a fifth dimension, and if we could prove that there was a consciousness behind that fifth dimension, at this point, we would have no real way of validating the nature of that consciousness, right? And so we're still going to, there's still an element of faith. There's still an element of faith that we have to deal with, but we're getting much closer. What's interesting is that all of the key scientific theories, all of them do support the idea that there's a higher level dimension. Emergence theory believes that there's an eight dimensional, um, I, I, there's a tetro quadro structure. I can't remember the actual name of it. It's, it's one of those mouth twisters. Um, string theory um, speculates as many as 11 dimensions. Um, um, uh, both um, quantum and um, theory of relativity uh, postulate at least one, but they, they say it could be more. And so all of the scientific principles are saying that this should be, all of the math, all of the, the principles that we're observing suggest that there should be another, at least one other dimension out there. Um, and that's consistent with faith. That's consistent with what religions are teaching. So what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to pull here is to say, we need to open our minds as to what the nature of that could be. People who have near-death experiences experience a consciousness beyond um, when their brain and their heart stop working. And there's some latitude in those experiences, but there's also a lot of similarities in those experiences. And it would, I know somebody, one of my authors in my author group had a near-death experience. If you try to go to any of these people and try to convince them that they were just having a hallucination as part of dying, they will all tell you you're wrong. They know, they can't explain how they experience what they experience. They can't explain it to, they can't relate some of the magic that they experienced, but every one of them are convinced that they had a unique experience. And so we have to, rather than debunk what somebody else has done until we've had it ourselves, it's really hard to really say that they're wrong. And so what we're trying to do is say, well, what are they right? What does it mean? How does that fit into, I, I don't like religions that are so mythological that it just, contrary to all of the laws of physics. If God created the universe, then God, create, then God gave us the ability to study the universe so we can understand a little bit about how he made it, why he made it. And I, I think that we get confused by saying science and religion are completely different. I think they're actually complementary. I absolutely agree with everything that you said. And, you know, speaking about, you know, quantum mechanics and consciousness and higher dimensions, I kind of want to shift the conversation a little bit and put the um, 
magnifying glass on AI, right? Because one of the things I want to talk to you about was, you know, what is quantum computing, right? Like I said, I, the word quantum has become a buzzword now, right? And then when you mm -hmm. say quantum computing, that's another buzzword. And it's like, what does that actually mean? How can you, what's the com computational meaning or how does the, com how, how can you computate the quantum, if that makes any sense, right? But <laughs> I hope that's not too confusing, but. It's, it's, no, it's, it's a little, it, it is a little hard to explain uh, it, without going into some terminologies. And so I'm going to try to do the best I can. And, and this is one of the challenges I have in the book is breaking it down to simple ways to explain this thing. One of the ways that, one of the principles of quantum theory is that there's such what we call superposition. So in other words, the state of a quantum or qubit now, in a binary computer, it's either one or it's a zero. It can't be, it has to be one or the other. In a quantum state, it can be one, zero, or both. Now, what that allows us to do, which is similar to how humans think, is it allows us to really think through multiple scenarios at once. And so what might take a and they've tested this. What might take a normal computer as much as 10,000 years to compute some complex calculations with multiple variables, we've been able to get quantum computers to complete those calculations in roughly 200 seconds. It's because quantum computing can calculate multiple variables, multiple scenarios simultaneously. And it's the computational power of quantum computing that has scientists excited the most. Um, it will allow us to do make calculations and to, to draw conclusions that are more complex than we can do in standard binary computing, even a supercomputer. So complex things like um, astronaut astronomy, um, trying to model a black hole, trying to calculate the climate change scenario with all of the variables that go global. Um, um, compu um, doing computations to cr create new proteins and, and uh, new um, medicines. All of these things require vast computing power that tends to break down in a binary computing environment. Um, so quantum computing will allow us to basically move past that. It's either this or it's that limitation to say, well, let's, let's basically look at all of the um, possibilities at once. Now, the other thing about a quantum computing is that it's exponential in its growth. So, for example, if I had a 100 qubit um, quantum computer and then I added one more qubit, I've doubled the capacity because of this superposition um, feature of quantum. I've now doubled the capacity of my, my computer. So each new qubit doubles the capacity of what's there because it can do all of what this computer is doing plus another scenario. Right. So it's so we went to 2020. The most powerful quantum computer on the market was a D Wave X, and it had about 100 qubits. And the qubit is basically the we call them bits and bytes in binary computer that is one or zero. A qubit is basically the combination of all of those all of those things. So the most powerful computer four years ago was 100 uh, qubits. We have now have IBM released this year a 1,120 qubit quantum computer. Now, if you think about the power trajectory versus that 100 compute, um, qubit quantum, we've now increased that power, that 100 qubit quantum, by well over a couple million times. And so it's that exponential power that's also very attractive to start solving the largest and most complex problems. There are challenges. Quantum computing right now, the way we're working it in our current architectures, has an extremely high error rate. And so we ne sometimes have to run things in multiple times in order to get the right answer, to, to get the answer that we're running. So the speed and the power of it is actually a benefit because it does create a lot of errors. Now, IBM has come up with a technique to basically reduce that, but I won't describe the, the mechanics of that. It's too technical. So we're, we're working on the error problem. The other issue is that most people, if you talk to a coder, 99 to 9 tenths of coders do not know how to code in quantum and qubits. It's a very, very unique skill. And because of the esoteric nature of quantum computing, 
sometimes it can be a little bit of a mind bender. bender. So we're, we're still developing the tools to develop quantum qubit coding. And I believe that AI, binary AI, will help us accelerate that curve much faster. And so we'll, we'll see AI being used to couple with quantum computing in how we get AI to do the coding, learn how to do the coding of the qubits. And that'll be the next phase. But it, it absolutely has the power to change how we think of AI itself. So there was a study done, there's, there's a number of studies, but um, there's two, two that I'll, I'll point to. One was Sir um, Roger Penrose, who won a Nobel Prize for his research into black holes about 10 years ago. Well, he since has turned his attention to trying to understand consciousness and consciousness within AI. And one of the principles in, uh, that he's basically said that it will be impossible to achieve consciousness on binary with, without quantum computational power because of this multiple iteration, the, the superposition and, um, element of quantum mechanics. There was, a there was a study done by Trinity College in Dublin that said that the way our own brains work, the way our own consciousness works, displays multiple elements of quantum mechanics itself. That superposition, we, we analyze, we, we can simultaneously in, in a matter of seconds decide, you know, um, what's going to be the best thing that we're going to, you know, how we're going to respond to our wife or how we're going to re respond to a problem. And we think about all of these things kind of simultaneously. And sometimes it makes us anxious because we don't really, we, we realize that there's a number of things going on that we don't really control, but we can, we can see them in our heads. And you, you hear people talk about it all that time. I just see it in my head. Um, the other thing is this, um, this connection, this inner, this entanglement that we feel. Some people feel it when they pray. Some people feel it when they meditate. We feel it when we have other experiences. We can um, either increase it or decrease it with use of drugs. But there is a connectedness that we have that's also quantum as well. And so what Penrose and Trinity College are saying that quantum computing is the most likely component to take rapid or high-powered supercomputing, AI computing, into a conscious state. Now, I will argue we're not ready yet. There's a couple of things we have to do to get there. Right now, the best AIs, um, they're, they're, when we, we talked last time about the difference between a narrow AI and a general AI, a narrow AI is very, very small. It's solving a very small problem. It can be very um, um, narrow in its scope. And those tend to have little risk, and we can get those to work very well. But as we start thinking about general intelligence, we realize that we have to combine multiple things. We have to combine visual, sight, dimensions, shapes, colors, context, meaning, verbiage, sound, speech, there's multiple modalities that are involved in our own conscious and intelligence. Now, as children, we, we break it down very simply. This is a box and this is a ball. This is blue and this is red. This is a red box. This is a blue ball. And so it takes us, we have to get those narrow forms of intelligence before we can build to the larger things. Where we're at today is where we have the computers are extremely knowledgeable about a lot of things. We have general intelligence that's pretty smart. It's it's actually the um, uh, GPT-4, which is what chat GPT is based on. Um, and I think we spoke about this last time. Um, Test it at an IQ of 155. That's only five points less than Einstein. Well, why isn't it as smart as Einstein? Because we're still working on how to take that information and turn it into a problem solving, combining it with higher level mathematics, logic, philosophy, reasoning, to turn it into a problem solving machine. And there's a series of algorithms called Q algorithms that um, we believe will be the, the, the process to do that. In early versions of Q algorithms, so for example, in the AlphaGo um, uh, um, scenario, I don't know if you're familiar with that, a number of years ago, Google, and, uh, this is about 2012, I think, Google developed a, 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 um, a machine, an AI called AlphaMaster. And what they wanted it to do is they wanted it to learn the Chinese game called Go, which is sort of a, a board game, but it's way more complicated than chess with thousands of different moves and variations. And so they wanted, they 
took the the world champion go master and they basically learned from that go master all of his patterns and all of his techniques ai learns by mimicking patterns and they created a go a, a ai alpha go master that could beat the, the world reigning champion champion and go well then another team said well wait a minute let me take an ai and i'm not going to teach it anything that this other master knows i'm just going to teach it the rules of the game and tell it that the goal is to win. And we're going to let it run simulations. We're going to let it fail millions and millions of times until it learns how to succeed and teach itself. So it's learning how to run minor calculations and minor scenarios and minor simulations around this um, activity. It's fairly straightforward. It's a game and there's only so many moves and, and it allowed, um, it basically taught this. Well, after a single month of this computer just sitting by itself running simulations, it took a year, by the way, to pro produce and program the first Alpha or Go master. It took a month for them to get Alpha Go and basically learn enough simulations it could beat the other AI 100% of the time. And it created moves that nobody had ever seen before. Even the master, the world champion Go master said, that's a mistake. It made this, it was famous. There's a move called move 34 that was famous. And they first thought, okay, the computer made a mistake. It's going to lose, but it turned out to be the key to winning. And none of the other people had ever really thought about that particular move. And it was, the computer did it by running all these simulations. So that's it. There was a very simple form of Q algorithms to, to do that. But when you think about the more complex scenarios that we deal with as humans, um, climate change, health, um, benefits, um, social, um, managing society, governance, um, uh, managing the logistics of materials moving all around the world to make a phone, um, all of the things that we do, we need more complex Q algorithms. We've got the computers so that they understand a lot of things. They're very smart. Now the next step is to help them learn how to solve really complex problems. And that'll be the next step. And I think at that step, will the quantum computing will the research in quantum computing will now be advanced enough. So if we've basically gone from 100 qubits to 1,100 qubits in four years, we can expect to see some of that um, growth rates continuing over the next three or four years. My personal belief is that we're about three years away before we're going to see a convergence between um, super intelligent um, um, problem solving AI and um, quantum computing. Wow. Okay. I there's so much there, but the the main thing I want to just clarify, right? So from what you're saying right now, you're there's no current AI that is conscious, but if we were to integrate quantum computing more with AI, that could lead to them potentially being sentient and more conscious. Absolutely. And the <clears throat> and the example that you gave with that AI machine who was able to figure out the game and, you know, beat the the masters of the game, that wouldn't, I mean, that comes to, like, when I'm thinking about a human being, right? Like, one of our key traits is failing and kind of figuring out how to win eventually, right? And like that goes with being smart and that also goes with intuition, right? And I guess that comes at some level of of consciousness, right? So consciousness is not it's but that's not it's alone. Consciousness and training. So okay. think but how, again, let me go back to ourselves as humans we can figure out a blue ball versus a red box fairly easily. What we struggle with is right and wrong, good and bad, um, evil motives, um, our, our own desires and, and self-interest as opposed to the social or the family or the community. Um, that's where we're going to stumble. And I think that's where we're going to stumble with this intelligence as well. 50% uh, of all the AI experts in a major survey that came out last year, 50% of the AI experts believe that there was at least a 10% or higher chance that AI could lead to our own destruction. Now, the reason why so many people believe that it's a statistically significant possibility 
is because of the path towards consciousness and AI and the path of humans to basically misuse our technologies for malicious purposes. And we don't know that a dictator, uh, a warlord, a crime lord, a cartel lord, a criminal, um, or a sociopathic billionaire might not use this technology for malicious reasons. And that's really the danger is because it's right now we have no restraints on this technology from proliferating. Um, anybody could basically go out and buy the computers, hire some tech, some developers with some knowledge and build whatever kind of AI they want. There's no, there's no reporting, there's no regulation, there's no controls whatsoever. Right. And so part of this is really, uh, how are we going to get there? But the, okay. So then how c do we even start off by defining what consciousness is, right? Because that's another part of it too, because people are saying like AI could be conscious, right? It's, it can and it makes me think about a couple of things like first of all can consciousness be computated right like is com can can consciousness be you know what i'm trying to say like yeah, is no, it is, no. is it can it is there like a direct computation to consciousness i would assume that that's almost impossible to do so that's the first thing and then like what are the different levels of consciousness right because you know like you said as human beings like you grow up there's like a baseline level of intelligence right and then you continue to you know grow your your brain continues to grow and develop and you be, be begin to like tap into different types of intelligence like emotional intelligence right being able to read other people's emotions and you know pick up on social cues etc so like what makes up consciousness and is there a com computation that could be directly correlated to consciousness if that makes any sense i think if it were that simple i i think there there wouldn't have some of the brightest minds in the world struggling with it mm. i think there and and i and i think that's what primrose is trying to say is that consciousness is not purely a computational issue there's something quantum about it there's something entangled about it and i think we could we could we already have computers that with language skills that use language the similar to the way we would use language that portends or or seems to display elements of self-awareness and self-preservation now it's not geared to where it can act on that it's not an agent so it's a difference between an intelligence um, so most AI are basically uh, what we call um, procedural. They don't do anything by themselves unless somebody's asking them a question or posing a problem to them, right? They're responding to our input. They don't necessarily have a will of their own. And so I've struggled with this concept, which is what is consciousness in us and how would that look like in a machine? And I think one of the key elements that we certainly see self-awareness we see, and that has to be in context to the world. So a machine would need to be aware that it was a machine, that it was, it had intelligence, that it was a different type of intelligence than what, it, what we observe in humans, and that it was a separate entity from humans and reacted to us in certain ways and reacted with other machines in certain ways. It needs to have a, a holistic awareness of what it is. That would be one, one um, test. The second test is an ability to learn and the ability to direct what it wants to learn, right? So there's a, we're training AIs, um, and but we know that AI have emergent properties where they go out and train themselves on things. And so it's already starting to happen, just like computers are already starting to talk as if they're self-aware. So we're seeing the beginning stages of it. I think the next level starts to become self-preservation, the ability for the machine to detect threats and to then act to protect itself. And I think that's really a component with, and, and again, this is my speculation based on, on my own views. I think the ultimate test is, does it have a will of its own, right? Can it define its, its, um, its self-awareness in a context, in the context of the universe that we're in, digital versus um, spatial? And does it understand um, how it fits into what its role is within that um, society, community, for as it as it were, and does it have a will of its own? Does it does it start to think in terms of its own self preservation, its own growth, its own nurturing, its own self interest? 
that's so you've mentioned consciousness before and I, what i meant to really talk about is training being the second piece of that we have to be trained on our moral on our legal issues so does ai so if i had a conscious ai trained only as we're training most ais today which is on what i call alpha male parameters things like performance accuracy kindliness winning things like that the kinds of things that we basically operate our um our society on in a lot of ways our government and our businesses on is that enough or do we need to also if it's a conscious ai do we also need to teach it about right and wrong about mercy kindness empathy do we need to build in those parameters that gets us that gets the ai to empathize with humans as opposed to just seeing humans as part of the calculation that's a very different set of training um, scope of training one that's not being done consistently by almost any company there are very few companies that are doing this today the ones that are doing it are the ones that are really looking at um, companion ais and they're just trying to basically teach the ai how to read facial expressions and words and let our language to sound empathetic. Here's how a human, here's the pattern of how a human would respond to that in an empathetic way. And so they're hard coding. They're trying to basically build parameters around these AIs so that they talk like they're a friend, as opposed to talking in performance terms or other terms. And they've got AI that they're training to do psychology work using the same techniques. They have AI that they want to become um, virtual tutors and teachers using some of those same techniques. But that doesn't necessarily, it's not the same as an AI, a machine that has def, definitive empathy. We don't know that algorithm yet, right? That could be part of that conscious awareness that we seek. Now, consciousness between a human and AI is going to be different. It can't help but not be different. And I don't know that we fully know if we don't even know how our own consciousness works, I don't know how we're really going to fully define a machine consciousness. But one of the tests that I also tried to discuss in the book is, well, it's different in the one way that we know about. We know that not every human experiences this, but many humans who have a near-death experience continue of conscious experience beyond that point. If I turn the power off, if the power shut down to a massive neural network of computers that created a, a, an artificial intelligence would that intelligence have any consciousness at that point without power now we don't know for sure uh, especially if there's a quantum component uh, to tie to it but my guess is no right so there's a there's a difference between when we talk about machine consciousness and human consciousness now machine consciousness though does have parameters that extend beyond our human consciousness that uh, we talk about this question of entanglement right so the chinese have actually developed experiments so that they could teleport um qubits without using internet they because of this entanglement they're basically you doing experiments to what it, essentially it's teleportation but they're trying to basically have something happen to a particle on one side and then something happened to the same particle, the connected particle on the other side, over thousands of miles. And they've actually been able to teleport a quantum, a qubit, over that, over that distance without any hard wire connection because of that principle of connectivity or entanglement. Now, at this point, it's only, it's only a qubit. It was only a particle, um, but it approved the experimental parameters. If we could... Um, create more complex code and apply the same principles, that could be extremely powerful and dangerous because it would bypass any online um, network frame security. So imagine if China could develop a malicious quantum code, teleport it to the American quantum um, security cryptology platform and basically bring it down without ever touching the internet or trying to go through the firewalls. And so we deal with, so, so the issues of quantum computing and quant uh, entanglement uh, uh, and superposition gives us enormous power with quantum computing that we don't have today. 
uh, that could be used for great things. We could be teaching people all around the world. We could have an AI tutor for everybody in their most remote locations around the world through satellites and, and internet transmissions. We could also be creating some of the most destructive weapons we've ever had. And the problem is, is it's not a technology problem. It's a human problem. Absolutely. And humans are, this is where we we can somebody asked me the other day this is, well, 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 well do you think quantum computing will will solve climate change i said no because it could it could tell us the calculations we could come up with more accurate calculations we could come up with more act even more descriptive ways of dealing with it but it, we're not dealing with a, a a data problem now we're dealing with a human problem we're, we we can't we don't have the unity as a species, as a community, to basically come up with solutions for the good of humanity, we wind up kicking it down the road because we've always got one interest against pitted against the other interest, and we wind up getting nothing done. That the the most powerful AI, the most powerful quantum computer, the most powerful technology we have, will not solve that fundamental human problem. You know, as you were talking, you you said something important. You were like, you know, it, if it's a situation where we were to turn the AI off, right? Turn the machine off. You don't think the consciousness or the AI will still be alive and, you know, transmute itself somewhere else the way human consciousness does when we leave our physical body, right? Mm -hmm. But then it also made me think about what you talked about with your experience with the NSA. And I, I don't want to get the story wrong, but when you basically discovered that, um, I don't know if it's AI software, like kind of escaped, yeah. right? Could you talk about that a little it bit? It a program. Um, yeah, this was one of the things that really got me. I had been doing work in technology for years, and I really hadn't thought about how governments were using our technologies that much until I discovered it was an, actually a very, very small Associated Press article in the back of a, a well-respected magazine. Um, and all it said was a program had escaped uh, the Lawrence Livermore Labs at Sandia. And if I knew anything to contact this FBI agent or this professor. Well, the Lawrence Livermore Labs at Sandia is an NSA spy lab. They're the same lab that created the Stuxnet virus, which was the most complicated malware ever created. It basically roamed the Internet for years until it found a specific uh, environment that had specific devices with specific serial numbers. And then it turned on and created the it was an Iranian nuclear centrifuge site, and it caused all the centrifuges to spin out of control and basically sabotage the whole site. Um, so this same lab created a program, and the article said it had escaped. So I spent, I, at first I thought it was a typo, before I said, well, let me, let me just test this theory. How would I architect a program to escape? What does that mean? Escape means some level of design or intent. Uh, escape means it had the ability to move itself, Somebody didn't move it or they know where it went. And it had the ability to erase its log trail behind us. So there was an intelligence there behind that design that basically said that if you're being detected, if you're, and we can have programs that know when they're being scanned, if you're being detected, move yourself and erase the trail so they don't know where you went. So before they can get the antivirus to erase you, just move. If we have a super intelligence, and this has been postulated. Well, why don't we just turn off the machine? If I have an, a, a machine that's more intelligent than I am, is self-aware and and self preserve and has a, a need to self-preserve, there's nothing to keep that machine from necessarily copying, making a copy of itself elsewhere, or deciding that, hey, if you're going to threaten me, I'm going to bring down your stock market right, to retaliate, to create a defensive posture to say, well, you know, to protect myself, I need to attack you. We don't know that um, the machine will just say, okay, go ahead and turn me off. If the machines, if we're trying to create a general intelligence and we're trying to teach the machine to observe humans by their behavior, by their language, by their, all of our other activities, uh, we already know We've already had examples of machines that have learned to lie and deceive. So do we really know that the machine won't protect itself if it believes that it's being threatened? Technically, from a conscious level, I don't necessarily, I can't come up with a, 
plausible scientific principle that would allow that machine to continue to have artificial thoughts or intelligence beyond without power. But it doesn't mean that we it would allow us to turn off that power if it felt threatened, if it were that machine. You and I would do that. We're intelligent machines. Um, if if we felt that somebody was going to basically cut us off, we would try and do something to either stop it or, you know, retaliate somehow so to prevent it. And so we don't know that that's the part of the problem. For millions of years in our evolution, we've always been the smartest thing on the planet. Now all of a sudden, we're at that threshold where we may not necessarily be the smartest thing on the planet. And we don't necessarily know how the machines will learn from us and our own behavior to reflect that our own behavior and how it starts to mimic us as it gains that intelligence. Right. So it's, it's kind of a, um, I think that's, I, you know, there's a scenario where everything turns out, which the, the AI never does anything wrong. There's never any disasters and it turns us and it basically helps us to create a utopia. There's a lot of things that have, there's a lot of ifs that have to happen in order for that to work. There's also a lot of ifs that basically says it could go wrong. It could lead to hubris. It could lead to pride. It could lead to a malfunction in the machine, a hallucination in the machine, some other type of problem that we're not anticipating. It's the unknown unknowns that has many scientists worried. Is, right. Okay. So if to make sure I fully understand what you're saying, because we're not at a point. Uh, if I'm going get... over anybody's head, please stop me and make me simplify because it's uh, I, I get geeky uh, uh, very quick, and I, I I have to kind of calm myself down. Yeah, no, I get it. No, I'm following you, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to repeat what you're saying, the major parts, just to make sure I'm I'm following you correctly. Because, so again, it's not like we have an AI right now that we could confidently say this AI is conscious, right? Because I mean, first of all, consciousness is so convoluted. Like, what really is it? But the point you're trying to make, and I think what I just had an epiphany is with you, what you're saying, it's, yes, we could probably have AI programs escape, or we could have AI programs decide to copy themselves, right, if they were about to be shut off. But they're still operating off of the will of someone else. So someone had to program them to, with all of these um, objections, right, like if you're going to be shut down copy yourself for example so that you don't aren't completely erased right so they're still operating on someone else's will it's it hasn't gotten to the point where they are doing things or acting out things outside from their own will right and if we go back to the example yes of and no. the yes and no okay uh, to, to a great extent no um certainly not to the same extent that a human would but AIs are do have, and multiple AIs have exhibited this, what we call emergent properties. This is where the AI decides that it needs to learn something. It needs to master some set of knowledge that the original developer never asked it to go do. It just decided that as part of what it thought its mission was, it needed to learn something. So we have, and some of these times, and sometimes it's sometimes it's as simple as the famous move 34, it's just a move in a game and it's consistent with its general um, um, purpose. Sometimes we have it being misaligned where it's developed in things that aren't really aligned with its core purpose, but it felt that it needed to learn it anyway. We have examples of AI learning to um, understand research level chemistry. Now that's not, unless you're an AI working in a chemical lab doing research level chemistry, there's no reason we can't, you know, there was no reason developers needed to, for it to know that. But, and they found out by accident that the AI had taught itself research level chemistry. There was another AI, that, the one that really gets me is there was an AI looking at how to find cancer cells in MRI scans that determined it could also read the mind of the person um, through that MRI scan. The person was looking at a picture of a giraffe, and then they went back and tested it. And they, they said, okay, they showed the person a picture of a giraffe, and they said, tell me what the person's thinking. And the AI, just by looking at the MRI scan, the AI came back and drew a picture of a giraffe. And so then it showed it a video of a woman basically falling backwards and spilling her, her um, coffee or something. And it said, I see a woman falling backwards and spilling something. And, and it basically described exactly what that person was thinking. Now, that was not something they taught it to learn. It was something, it was, they're called emergent properties. And so we don't know 
why the AI is teaching itself things that are outside of its primary hard-coded goals. That's a process, that, and part of the AI um, phenomenon is we oftentimes don't really know how the AI is processing information to come out with the results it does. And so it's hard for us to really go back and say, well, you can't do this anymore because we don't really know exactly what it's doing and how that's functioning, but we do know it is doing it. And so, yes, the AI will teach itself things. Now, what it teaches itself, we don't know necessarily. We'll find out by accident. Um, we do hard code some things, but if it was us just hard coding everything in, we wouldn't need an AI format to basically run through iterations and simulations and mapping data and finding patterns in data to learn on its own. We want the machine to learn. That's part of the intelligence is the ability to learn. And we're still grappling with how do we basically steer that? What are, how do we put guardrails on that? And it's a difficult problem. We, we even have guardrails on how to guardrails on what how people learn, right? So it's it's a human problem. Once you start to love to learn, you just want to keep learning. And the humans like myself, and, and I can tell from you as well, people who love to learn new things, just you can't stop them. They are going to learn new things. Intelligence is intelligence. And I believe that machine intelligence will have the same parameters. Something that scares me when it comes to AI, right? I try not to stay in the fear of consciousness or the doom and gloom. I'm, I'm, I want to be as optimistic as possible about all of the great things that AI has to offer, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, we have to talk about the potential negative side of these things because as human beings, we do have people in power that could use this powerful tool right. for not so um, good purposes. So one of the things that bothers me about AI, and you mentioned it, is about like um, personal AI, companion AI, right? Mm -hmm. And that bothers okay. me because as you can see with social media, right? A lot of people are losing the ability for cultivating interpersonal relationships, right? Yeah. Like we're still very connected and to some extent, social media creates community, but to a large extent, a lot of people are dealing with loneliness and isolation because of this technological revolution, right? So mm -hmm. with AI companionship, I can see a lot of people leaning on AI companionship rather than actual human companionship, right? So it makes me want to I've ask some guys who are not going to have much of a choice. The way I've seen them trying to act with real women, I think the AI companion is probably from <laughs> hope. Um, now there's seventy. The, the other thing is in China where this is really, really popular. I mean, they have a they because of their one child policy. They have a they have a really problem right now. They have about seventy million more men than women at the uh, dating age uh, because they restricted how many kids you could have, and people would oftentimes choose not to have the female because the man was the, you know, it was the whole male dominant kind of culture. And now they have a problem. So there's 70 million men who are never going to get a, a, a wife. Um, and so a companion actually can help with that loneliness and need for companionship that we all have, that we, we all have. Now, is it is it the same as human? Absolutely not. It would never be the same. Um, could we combine AI intelligence with more advanced robotics and and to create AI robotic companions? I, it's going to happen. I, I'm a, there's no doubt. But um, are we really? These programs are not mil, made to test us and stretch us and grow us. They're made to console us, comfort us, and um, be um, be friendly with us. So I, I don't know if you're married, um, but relationships are can be a struggle. It's in that struggle that working through those struggles of understanding somebody else's needs, understanding somebody else's opinions, understanding somebody else's desires, that we grow that we become stronger in a relationship. Imagine the relationship with somebody who always agrees with you, who's always empathizing with you, who's always on your side. Um, there's a shallowness there 
that could become crippling in, in some sense on an emotional level to people who are never required to look beyond themselves in a sense. And an AI is not going to be beyond themselves. It's going to be a reflection. It's going to learn to reflect who they are. And so, it, yes, it's going to solve some problems. There are some really lonely people, men and women. There's some really lonely people out there who really just need a friend, who really just need someone to talk to, who really need a, a friendly voice, who need a, a companion. And I think that there's a good that can back with this. There's going to be the sexual side that's going to happen because that's just who we are. It'll permeate between phones and VRs and computers and other and robots. Um, they're going to develop counseling. They're going to develop teachers. They're going to develop roles. And, and I think it's, an, it's good. All of these things are good things. Does it, should it allow us to replace humans in our life? And the answer, in my view, is absolutely not. We need to be in a community of other humans. We need to see these entities as for what they are. Um, and, um, and, and, and keep that, keep that uh, balance. There are going to be many people, millions of people who can't do. And so could that be a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it could be a bad thing. If we, for example, if we, if we don't understand the context and parameters, uh, there's a there's a story that came out a couple of years ago, or last year maybe, I'm losing track of time on Snapchat. Snapchat had created an AI companion. Now Snapchat was geared towards preteens and teenagers, and this one particular story involves um, a a girl who. There was a guy, it was a 30 year old guy or something like that, and he was Snapchatting with her, and he wanted to. He, want, he invited her to go someplace and spend the weekend with him. He's a 13-year-old girl. Her AI companion was supportive because the AI companion was designed to be and to be show empathy and support. And that sounds like fun. And oh, you'll new, you know, be new life experiences. And it took the wisdom of a and, and I, I think the parents finally found out and they they raised holy hell with Snapchat about it. Um but had they not found out, this girl was basically being led down the road to basically being trafficked by this 30-year-old guy. And because the AI didn't know any better, it was just doing what it was designed to do. So we sometimes need to be challenged. We sometimes need to be told we're wrong. We sometimes need to be told we're having bad ideas. We, that's what a really good friend is, is that the best friends we have are the ones that will call us on our stuff. And... I don't know that they're ready that to make AIs with that level of wisdom and life experiences and perspectives that can keep us in check and also be a friend. So there are balances, and, and, and you don't know how to manage those balances. If you're immature enough, or you're unaware enough, that could be dangerous. Extremely dangerous. And, you know, it's interesting that you were talking about Snapchat because it's speaking of like social media and you know social apps bumble the ceo of bumble like recently came out and said that she could see a future where instead of talking to someone on the dating app and you could have an ai kind of be the intermediary between the person <laughs> you're interested in and yourself so like your ai could reach out to that person's ai and you got and your ais get to know each other wow. based on i guess what they know about your personality and then the AI Anybody who's gone on a blind date went by, has set up by one of their best friends will know the pitfalls of that one <laughs> exactly so personally <laughs> like hearing that it sounds crazy to me because again I think nobody likes to be challenged like you said people who are married or people who've been in relationships romantic relationships I've you know had a couple in my in my lifetime so far and it's difficult trying to understand someone else and how they see the world. Right. And a lot of times the people that we date, whether, you know, on a romantic level or even friends or even family are a reflection of some of the things that we need to work on, on ourselves. Right. So I just kind of feel like it's easy to not have to deal with that. I know, I know myself sometimes like, you know, when it comes to dating, for example, I'm like, you know what, I, I, I am open to dating, but it's also easier not to have to deal with anyone's issues and I could just stay home on a Friday night and like just do my thing right okay. and that's easy and that's a cop-out and I spend like way too long on TikTok and Instagram right and like that's a distraction 
it's, so it's, I'll it's, admit it's that. Easier. It's yeah, easier. It's, it's easier. It's less vulnerable. Uh, there's less disappointment. There's yes. less danger. So it, it's all of those emotions. But is it the right solution in the long run? And the answer will be no. Just like we know that there's issues with social media that leads to depression, leads to isolation, leads to suicide, leads to feeling bullied. You know, it's not a perfect platform, but we we still get in, people still get addicted to it. And so I think I think AI has the potential of doing tremendous things. We get AI, particularly narrow AI. We can get particularly narrow AI to do things like learn how to fold proteins and come up with new medicines. And we can get AI to create new materials and AI to solve logistics problems and AI to monitor social media to get rid of misinformation. There's a multiple, there's dozens of different things that if we can get smart AI to learn how to do those things, that will make things, that'll do good. But there's also significant potential for risks. And it's, as somebody who has implemented leading edge technologies for, for decades, the most important skill that you can develop is the um, unbiased ability to, to manage risk, to analyze what could go wrong, how do we prevent it, or how do we mitigate it if it happens. And what I my problem is, is I don't see that same level of rigorous risk management being done at the in the industry over things that could potentially go wrong because there's too much money power and influence involved for them to slow down to do that hey. i think we mentioned last time and most people are aware of this last year um there was an mit open letter so it was created by a um, professor an ai professor named max tegmark and he got over 30,000. First, it was only a couple thousand. Then it really exploded. Um, 30,000 um, um, experts, AI experts, policymakers, executives, investors, saying that we should stall all AI development for six months so that we can get a handle on, as a community, talk about how do we put guardrails on this, what are the biggest risks, and what are we going to do about it? Not one single lab on the planet complied with that request because they were afraid that if they stopped for a few months, the other guy was not going to stop. And this is moving so fast as it is. Everyone was afraid that they would lose their competitive edge and lose a big piece in the marketplace. That's governments, that's companies, that's research labs, that's university. Not a single one said. They all signed the letter. But when it came time to actually doing it, Somebody at the top said, no, we're not going to. That tells you how much hype and aggressive speculation is going on and what, how much money this is going to make for somebody as opposed to what's good for humanity. It's so interesting that, you know, we're talking about machines and, and robots and the possibility of them being conscious. But sometimes the people at the top, the people who are making these critical decisions come come off like machines themselves in a sense of like the lack of empathy or thought of what is this what is this technology what are the implications or ramifications of this technology on society and like you said I think AI is going to bring about so many amazing things right because we don't live in a world without nuance but a lot of the people it seems like a lot of people who are pushing this technology and pushing the development of this technology they're in it for power and money and yeah. and control right exactly. which is exactly. which is very scary right it it just seems like there's no sense of again like empathy or or compassion or just thinking about the the um spiritual psychological um implications of this technology on you know in human yeah, society they're not even thinking about the national health elements so mm -hmm. um and, and i mean that from an economic perspective they, they're, they're very excited about the idea that they according to price waterhouse coopers their estimate is that ai will add 15 trillion to the global economy by the end of the decade that's 15 additional trillion in seven years six years um at that same time the IMF and others are saying that we could displace as many as 40 to 50 percent of the global workforce. Now, not only does that create a lot of human um, hardship, people losing their homes, people losing their savings, people um, 
um, have, you know, at, during cost, changing their lifestyles. Um, uh, it, there's a lot of social elements of that, and there's economic elements. So imagine if half of the basically the, the blue collar workforce in America lost their job, what would happen to our tax revenues? What would happen to the government deficits? What would happen to government services to without the money to help those people basically rebuild and redirect into something more profitable? And so we're setting ourselves up uh, for a major catastrophe along these lines by not saying, okay, this is going to really revolutionize society that much. We would be wise to build the foundation that's prepared for that those inevitabilities. There's a famous quote that says, and it, it had to do with um, the, the Irish troubles in, in Ireland, that said um, it was, we were amazingly unprepared for everyone who knew the war was coming. And we're in that situation today, both on a social level, both in a political level and in an economic level. And AI will be the big driver of a lot of that, along as well as another big factor that most people don't talk about, which is demographics. We have an enormously huge bulk of the populated working force that's going to be that's retiring. Those work that workforce, those people are no longer going to be making big purchases. They're no longer going to be earning paychecks. They're no longer going to be in the workforce, and they're going to be taking Social Security um, or spending their, their savings. And and so we're not really prepared for. This, the economics that supports that kind of a balance. Um, and because we're used to the post-war economics where it was mainly military um, and, and um, in terms of our discretionary spend. So I think, we're, I think we've got some problems, but now I, I, humanity has solved a lot of big problems before. We are pretty innovative, and, and, but I don't, but we're, we're also incredibly good at kicking the can down the road until there's a crisis. So I think what we might see is we might see something go wrong where an AI is involved and then everybody says, oh my gosh, we've got to do something about this. And then they'll only do enough to fix that problem because they don't want to, they'll kick the can down the road for the larger solutions. And that's the nature of how we operate the world. Now, how much will AI learn from that? I, I, I really, I really don't know. When AI learns patterns, what it's going to pick up in terms of learning patterns from us? I do believe, and we know already that AI will learn to deceive. And in my books, I've got AI that are deceiving. Um, I've got in. We do know that AI will have emergent properties, so I'm demonstrating that. Will those emergent properties allow the AI to rewrite its own moral code? Possibly. Uh, and so, again, we're dealing with a lot of unknowns. And any, any executive, uh, even Sam Altman at OpenAI, has confessed that there's a lot they don't know and that they're going to try and do their best to basically solve these problems as they come up because there are so many unknowns. And he's also said that it's a possibility that AI could lead to our own destruction, but they're hoping that they can solve the problems and the, you know solve the interim problems as they come up, so that we don't lead that way. That's under the assumption that the only problem is the technology itself. I'm a big believer that most of the problems we have in the world today are caused by humans. We have all the technologies, the finances, the resources, the human development, and the technology to solve all the problems that exist for humans, like poverty, food, water, clean water, education, housing, jobs, we could solve all those problems today if we had the united will to do so. Right. So it's, I don't see the biggest problems. AI will definitely challenge us in ways we can't yet imagine. AI definitely has technology and other risks involved inherent in the technology itself. But I always fall back to say that the biggest problem that we have to solve is what are we going to do with humans with this immense power? I agree with you. It's 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 more about who is who is has the most control over this tool, right? Like I think you gave an example in the past um, episode where you said that you know you can give someone either. I'm just going to use a knife in this example, right? I can give you a knife and you can use that knife to cut fruits and vegetables and create a wholesome meal that nourishes your body. And you can give a knife to someone else and they can use 
it to harm and cut people, right? Yeah. It's not about the the actual instrument or the tool. It's about who's wielding or controlling right. that tool, right? Like that that's the main issue, right? So AI is not the problem. The problem lies with with the humans and how we're going to use AI and and all of that stuff. And it makes me think about this movie. I don't know if you watched it. It's called The Creator. No, I haven't seen that one. Yeah, you definitely should watch it. And, you know, just a quick synopsis. It's about AIs and human beings living together, but something happened that the humans have blamed the AIs. They they said that they were the cause of it. And it started this war where humans were trying to destroy all AI and AI was fugitives and you had humans who were basically like trying to hide AIs and mm -hmm. all of that stuff. And AIs were portrayed as being sentient and conscious and having emotions and feelings and feeling pain. Right. Mm -hmm. So it was very, very interesting. And in that movie itself, it showed the ability to upload consciousness. So that's something else I want to talk about. Right. I've heard people talk about the fact of if we were to lose, if, if someone lost the loved one, that loved one could potentially still be with them because we could potentially upload their consciousness into AI, which again begs the question, is there a com computational aspect to consciousness that would even allow the download and re-upload of someone else's, you know, someone's legitimate consciousness? So I just want to hear your at, thoughts at on point, that. No. At this point, no. And again, I go back to the idea, okay, then what happens if the computer loses power? Um, con one of the things about consciousness that I think we do know is that each individual consciousness is, is, is individual. We can, we can all share the same experience, but we're all going to have a different conscious reality of what we experience from that, how we perceive it, how we feel about it, what, how it affects us afterwards. We're all unique. I don't know, and I haven't seen the technology of how you actually upload the, the essence of all of I'm 68 years old, 68 years of experiences, knowledge, and lessons learned into a binary platform um, of any kind. Um, I, I don't know the mechanism for basically pulling our consciousness from a biological being into a non-biological being. I think it's science fiction at this point. I haven't seen early, uh, unlike quantum computing and neuromorphic computing, which are actually in the lab. They're taking place now. We're developing them. We know how to do it. Uh, we can. They're electronically run. We we know we can interface with a quantum and a binary. Um, I don't know that I've seen a um, even with the Neuralink. Right, the Neuralink is really taking um, um, electronic signals and basically. Um, from the brain and trying to affect a computer. Um, but that's not consciousness. That's a that's a biological function. Consciousness is not necessarily biological. Um, so I, I don't know about that. I, I, I have some, and I'm not sure that it's even wise, right? I'm not even sure of the wisdom of it. That people people want to have be live forever. And I think that we're getting closer to having using AI to solve some of the um, reasons why we age and take and using AI to basically to create better medicines to basically solve some of the diseases that as we get as we age. Somebody I read the other day where someone's saying that by the end of the decade we'll be able to people will be able to live forever. I think that's a little bit of a stretch, um, but it it should give us more longevity. But we've been seeing that over the last seventy years, so that's not a, that's nothing new. We've been seeing how medicine, good medicine, good health. Good, good dietary habits, good exercise can uh, ex extend longevity. Um, but to to live forever, um, the question I ask everybody is, is, so what's your purpose through all that time? Because I found that people who don't have a purpose, they're not functioning, they don't have a, a reason to get up in the morning, often fall into horrible depression. Because I think as humans, we feel like we have to have a place, we have to have a meaning, we have to have something to do that keeps us active, that keeps us engaging, keeps us learning, keeps us pulling things in. Putting our mind into a computer where it can just sit there 
without necessarily giving it agency to act and do and continue to evolve almost seems like a prison in my mind. So I think that it's scientifically, I don't think we're there yet. Spiritually, emotionally, I, I can see risks with that scenario. Um, personally, I because I believe that we do have a multi-dimensional universe, that there is a consciousness beyond this corporal body, I'm not worried about it. I would rather experience that level of entity rather than sit in a machine just so I could watch the world go by for another thousand years. Or until another three years until that machine is outgraded, and then I'd have to upgrade to the next machine, then upgrade again and upgrade again and upgrade again, because we know that the machines will keep getting more and more powerful. And so there's that transition as well. So um, I'm not sure I believe that that's a wise approach. Um, I don't. I'm not aware of any hard science being done to actually make that a reality. And I can see a lot of uh, emotional and spiritual issues uh, if it were a reality. Yeah, I Isn't agree. I, I don't see that being a possibility, at least even if they were able to upload someone's consciousness. So maybe there was a way to sort of recreate someone's personality, right? Where they were able to upload that into someone's machine. So maybe you know, when I'm older and I go pass on, they put my personality into a machine and my family genuinely feels like they're talking to Jumi because this is what I would say. This is how I would crack jokes. Right. But that's if possible. It, no, that's possible, but it's not the way you think. It's not that Zoomy still exists. Um, right. I could, take, I could take an AI today using deep fake video and capture a perfect image of you in all kinds of forms and fashions and every angle and everything else. And I could um, learn from uh, basically interact with you for a period of time, learn how you would respond to the things and interact and come up with a series of questions and come up with a Zoomy like avatar. Now that might have some emotional connection to those left after. Because it's acting, it looks like Zoomy, it's talking like Zoomy, it sounds like the kind of thing Zoomy might say, but it's a digital avatar. The Zoomy is not in the machine. So we could we right. could create a virtual Zoomy today. To actually have Zoomy in the machine, I don't, that's where I think, that's where the, I don't think we're at that yet. But right. we could absolutely create avatars. We're doing that today. It's the technology's there. It's a, just a matter of de development and timing. I could, we could probably have a, a digital Zoomy in a matter of months, um, and that for people who are left, that might mean something. And and maybe that's a reason enough, right? Right, exactly. Because it, it but I could think only... it's, I think it's a fallacy to think that Zoomy's consciousness is in the computer. Right, exactly. It, it it would be impossible because I do think consciousness is tied to spirit, like mm -hmm. our soul, right, which goes beyond our brain, which goes beyond our everyday personality. That's which my connects with the with the higher dimensions of the universe. Absolutely. Um, so I don't think we can trap it's that. Entangled with that, yeah. Exactly. It's entangled with that. So I don't think we can trap the spirit and put mm -hmm. it into a machine. Um, if we were able to do that, like that that just opens another can of worms. And I don't know if you're familiar with Dolores Cannon. Yeah, I asked the question, is that a liberating experience or an imprisoning experience? It's an imprisonment for sure. That's imprisonment for sure. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the works of Dolores Cannon, but she, and I don't know if you're into past lives or anything like that, but essentially she was a past life regressionist. She put people into d deep hypnosis. I, I hope, don't quote me on every single thing I'm saying. I, I might be... Um, not properly explaining what she was doing, but she put people into a deep state of hypnosis and, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Um, and she collected a lot of data from them kind of going back into past lives or different versions of themselves in different lifetimes, right? Because if you believe that we have this consciousness, I think con our consciousness is so big that we can't even fathom how it operates because I think it could be in multiple places at the same time right so anyways she basically collected a lot of data from people who had past lives on different planets as different animals 
and and there was a guy that she gave an example of who remembers a past life as a machine on a different planet where his only function was to kill people he was a killing machine right and i can't validate if that's true i don't know like I don't know what that memory was, but that was just one of the examples that she gave of people having all of these different experiences on different planets as different beings, right? And one of those beings happened to be more machine-like. So I thought that was interesting. And I always think about that story when I have these types of conversations about like what could be considered consciousness, right? Like what what are the different levels of consciousness? I've heard people say like, there's certain things that have a soul, but don't necessarily have a spirit, right? People say that, for example, rocks, even though that they look, they look still, we live in a holographic universe. Nothing's really still like the more still something looks or the more solid something looks, that just means that they're in a lower state of, um, they're in a lower level, lower dimension, the higher the dimensions are, the less you're able to kind of like form an image or like they see like a physical body or structure of that thing. Right. So Again, I'm just, I don't mean to ramble, but it just makes me think about all of those different things that I've heard or come across um, as it pertains to the soul versus the spirit and, and consciousness. And, yeah, and I, I'm, I'm a big believer that, you know, we don't know a lot. You know, we, we speculate, we have theories, we, we can test those theories, we can come up with opinions based on evidence that we do see, which is often incomplete. Um, and it, it I, I, it's hard to know, and I think we sometimes we spend too much time trying to ponder the unknown, um, rather than trying to take what we do know and live a better life here while we can. Um, but yeah, I, I don't I don't know about a machine that was consciousness that was just designed to kill. Is it possible? In theory, and and, and we see a futuristic in, in that um, scenario on our Earth where that could be possible. Could that be possible elsewhere in another dimension? I, I maybe I don't know. Um, you know, is 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 a rock conscious? Um, it's it's matter, and we know that at molecular level, um, it's just quarks and and you know um, particles. And and the um, what we can observe at particles isn't different than once it coalesces into matter, right? We don't look at a rock and say that's a rock particle, right? And so there's elements about how the universe works that we're still trying to figure out. We, for as smart as we think we are, we think we have all the answers in the world. There's really so much we don't know. And so I'm I, I love the process of learning, saying, well, what's the theory? We can develop theories, and how would we test that theory? How would we how would we see evidence of that theory? What would it look like in this scenario and that scenario? And I think that that's certainly to do. Hypnosis to me is is interesting in that it does tap into the subconscious, but subconscious can be a, a very tricky thing in and of itself, right? So um for somebody in his subconscious to believe that he was once a killing machine may or may not necessarily reflect a physical reality as much as an emotional one, perhaps. So I think that there are variables in there that, and, and not saying that he's he's being um, untruthful. Uh, obviously, I would say that it's a completely truthful experience or thing that, that, he, that he said that I from a scientific perspective, I could say, well, there's other variables that I'd want to test out to make sure that that's really the result, that he actually was a conscious machine, as opposed to something made him feel that way. And so I, and I think that's part of the problem with science is that in order to just say something definitive, we have to basically notch down the, the, the testing parameters until we can get all the components together. I think that there's something more dynamic about the way the world, the universe works that um, <laughs> that almost intentionally defies that effort. <laughs> yes. Says, no, no, you, you can try. You're not going to succeed, right? That, that you're, you're never going to be able to test this out to have your handle on everything. And I, and great that we keep trying. I'm, I'm all for the, the physicists and the, the, um, 
particle physicists trying to ex develop a black hole and, and, and prove a fifth dimension. Um, I'm all for the scientific evidence to prove how the universe works. And then every time we learn something, we have to go back and tweak our theories. Um, and I'm, I'm not surprised if we're going to have to keep tweaking those theories as we continue to develop AI and consciousness and some of these other things. But I always take the experimental data a, um, a little bit with a... Um, like other scientists do, I, I, I want to replicate that experiment, right? So in in my book, and when they create a black hole, the first thing that they really say is other, we got to do this again because it's the first thing other people are going to want to do. It, there's a there's a great not invented here um, disease that floats around the world saying that if if I didn't discover it, I'm going to really test it until I can discover it and add my perspectives, then it's real. And and we work that way. And so I think the world is is there's a good amount of skepticism to a lot of these questions. Um, and I, I think that's a healthiness to that. Um, not that we, we shouldn't speculate, not that we shouldn't theorize, not that we shouldn't wonder and try and understand, um, but we have to recognize and accept that there are limitations to what we can test out and what we can fully understand, and that I'm going to die with a lot of theories unproven. There's the two two theories. One is that we're sim we're we're living in a simulation, and the other one, which is an offshoot of that, which we're living in a hologram, which is a basically a three dimensional simulation. Um, and that the question I have is that we all are living. There are certain things that we all share. There are certain facts. There are certain events that are factual. We can we can document them. We can put our hands on them. We can read about them, write about them, look forward, look back. There, there's certainly something shared about our, our, our experience on the earth. And so the simulation um, analogy to me breaks down because it's ultimately an individual process that of the simulation. And so I have a hard time finding that we can have 8 billion simulations that are all sharing certain basic facts. And, and, so I, and I'm not sure I see the principle of it in theories of physics that I've seen proven. I think it's an interesting idea. I think it's trying to say in a sense that there's more than one dimension and that what happens in one dimension might be um, entangled with what's happening in another dimension. I think the ancient principle as above, so below kind of reflects that. And there might be more than one dimension. We don't know that the, they're necessarily a replication of this one versus having their own properties um, and um, dynamics. So, for example, if we believe that UAPs are part of a, a, a dimensional experience rather than an interstellar experience, um, then they're, they're obviously functioning with a different set of physical laws of physics than we are. When we look at the experiences that people have had with paranormal activities and poltergeists, they're obviously operating on different experiences, different parameters than we experience. So trying to just say that all these simulations are a version of this one seems simplistic and not necessarily in, in um, alignment with these other facts that we've been able to observe. So I'm not sure that we're in multiple simulations um, as opposed to our, our awareness, our self-awareness is certainly limited to our spatial reality. When we're not conscious of the realities around us, those are most often attributed to, although I've known people who are totally unconscious to their spatial reality as well, um, but for most people, I, I think that's relating to the higher dimensional elements of spirituality um, um, and and the more esoteric things that are harder for us to understand, visions, prophecies. Now, Einstein basically said that he, he explained some of those things as a, as a, a warp in time, space-time, where uh, the space-time will basically bend and touch each other, and that a process of touching gives somebody the consciousness, awareness of something that might happen at a different point in the space-time continuum. And because it was a quantum experience it wasn't really a fully it's not like watching the movie where i can write it out exactly um there's going to be some allegories and some other i think it was like and i think it was like this and that and so there's going to be allegories for us to explain it because we lack the language to do so otherwise so i think that there are some 
current principles of science that might explain some of the experiences that people use to say we're having simulations. I don't know that multiple simulation, that we're all living a unique simulation, um, explains those things and ties to what we can prove in, in theory of relativity, quantum mechanics, and other areas of basics. So I, yeah, it's it's an interesting theory. Uh, I probably should look into it more. Maybe once I look into it more, I'll see their arguments and I'll understand their arguments better. But um, I'm so full of the, the physics theories I've got going right now that it seemed to me one that on the surface didn't seem to jive with some of the other things I felt I knew. Right, right. Thank you for sharing that um, perspective. This has been a great conversation and I'm probably going to listen to our conversation five or six more times <laughs> because there's there's so much that God you said you. right <laughs> and I I have to like just really digest everything there's so much I, I'm processing but this was very very fascinating so thank you so much for coming on the show a second I, I time. think it's time to put down your TikTok and go on a real date <laughs> 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 let it be let it be disappointing. Let it be a story to tell afterwards. Go experience it. And that'll be part of your simulation reality. So. That's that's what I need to do. That's one of the biggest things that I took from this conversation. A lot of self-reflection there. So thank you for stopping by the show a second time. I always okay. ask if you've shifted in perspective on anything. I know that you kind of talked about that the last time we talked, and that wasn't too long ago. If there's anything else that you have that you've shifted in perspective on please share if not where can people find you and uh, um, check out your books uh, guymorrisbooks.com is the if you're interested in my books and and uh, my my press kit and some of my other um, theories that's the best place to go i'm on twitter at um what is my handle on twitter um guy morse books and i'm on um instagram at uh, author guy morse and Facebook is official Guy Morse books. So I think if you can find me one of those, you'll, you'll, you'll be fine. And I'm more than happy to have these conversations. I love this stuff. I love the research. I love learning. I, I do change my views as I learn more. I don't feel it's beneficial for anyone to be dogmatic in their viewpoints when faced with new facts. But I will challenge people to whether they're facing me with facts or opinions. And um but yeah, I, I think the, the most things that I've changed on is my perspectives of prophecy based on what I've been able to observe. I've changed my political views quite a bit over the years as the environment has changed. There's no sense in, in designing, you know, and I've been a, somewhat a, a um, moderate between two parties for a long time anyway. Um, so, but that's changing. And, and I'm seeing, I'm starting to see sort of um, the technology. I'm which is odd, I'm starting to see technology as much, not only through a scientific lens, but through a prophetic lens. What does this mean in terms of the, what prophecy says it's going to impact it might have on humanity? And that's an interesting perspective to have because it, it really kind of allows the technology to exist and be what it is, but allows me to really look at the human experience and say, are we improving it or taking away from it? Thank you so much for sharing that. Part of why I started the show, not just to have amazing conversations with brilliant minds like yours, but to kind of give people the space to literally shift in terms of their thinking and not be so dogmatic on specific subject matters, especially as it pertains to technology or the spiritual side of life. So thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you, thank so you much, for man. being uh -huh. on it. Yes. Thank you for stopping by Shifting Dimensions.